Hello, this is Cecilia with Kentucky Rose Devotionals where we're finding all the roses in the Word of God. And today we are going to start a new topic of action speak louder than words. And we're going to get into the book of James. And I believe this is going to be an encouragement to me, an encouragement to you as you listen because all the people that I know, everyone that I talk to is going through some kind of trial. Um, they're either going through oppression, depression um, by the enemy to try to steal, kill, and destroy um, whether it's your thoughts, um, whether it's your finances, whether it's your family, there's attacks coming from all directions, and it might be it might be every direction you feel like that you're being attacked and, and oppressed, and you feel like God, what am I supposed to do in these times? What am I? What is what is it that you're calling me to do? Because I feel so discouraged. So what? How can I encourage myself in God today? How can I let my faith speak louder um, and do the things that you would have me to do in this? time because we're in a, a time where everything is being perverted and twisted and it is a time where we see that we know that Jesus could come at any moment and so we know these things but yet we feel like maybe that our life is just kind of being put in um, on the pause button if you will and we can't understand you know why aren't we moving forward why aren't we getting to do the things that we feel like that we need to be doing for the kingdom of God and so I want to bring this encouragement to you today in the book of James um, to let your faith speak through your actions that it's not enough anymore for us to just say we believe in God. That's not enough. Because even the demons, James is going to tell us, believe and tremble. They believe in God too. But that doesn't make you saved, does it? It doesn't make you um, a Christian. Just because you believe in God, your actions, your faith moving and working in the lives of people and changing their heart through your relationship with Jesus Christ, that you're relating to them the power of salvation. And that is being related through the fruit that you're producing. And that's what James is telling us. This letter was a letter to tell us the Christians. This is a letter to the Christians. This is not a letter to the unsaved. This is a letter to the Christian to say, rise up and take action. Do what you need to do to show and display that you are belong to Jesus Christ and there's fruit that's going to be displayed from that and people are going to recognize that you belong to Jesus because of the things that you're saying the things that you're doing and the fruit that you're producing when you live for God you produce fruit and that's what James is going to be be telling us about James a little bit of history on him he was the half brother of Jesus he was the oldest brother of Jesus okay and he was giving us this letter as an ethical aspect of the Christian life to show us that Christians should have ethics that Christians should be displaying faith through their actions that's not just that's not all of it but that's a good portion to uh, appeal to us is really what he was doing as a believer that this is vital that we put forth the outward actions that show the inward faith that we possess and it else, if we don't do that, then it's like saying that our faith has accomplished nothing. I don't want to go stand before the Lord one day and Him say that my faith accomplished nothing. I want to stand before Him and say that my faith was pleasing to Him, that my faith produced the fruit that drew many to know Jesus Christ. That's what God's asking all of us to do. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, the most important thing in our life right now with the coming of Jesus right upon us is are we right with God and how many people are we taking with us? Are we showing that fruit? Are we evidencing the fruit that a Christian should possess? And so realize today that if you're a Christian, it isn't enough to say you believe in God anymore. That's not enough. But we've got to put the evidence of that belief to work. We've got to show that. We've got to realize that without faith, um, you know, your faith without works is dead. It's dead. It accomplishes nothing, James is telling us. This is a living faith. And if you're going through trials and temptations, this book is like no other to get you through, to encourage you, to keep going. It's kind of like it's kind of like a, a little whooping for our soul is what it is. You know, we're getting, and when I say whooping, that's what, what we call it here in Kentucky when you got spanked when you were a kid. Um, sometimes, and, and I'm sure you needed it, um, when we get spanked, um, it, it encourages us to get on the right road and do the things 
that we need to do. And some, some of you out there may not believe in spanking, but I got a few growing up and it didn't hurt me a bit. I, it helped me uh, become a better person and it helped me to realize that I needed to do uh, something different. And I'm going to tell you one thing helped me realize I never did it again, whatever it was, because I didn't want to get that, that spanking again. So, you know, sometimes we need that. We need correction. We need rebuking to get us on the road that we need to be on so that we can get closer to God and be a light for Him to this world. So that's what James is doing. James was called James the Just. So we can get already his his personality, um, his attitude, and and what I think is interesting about James is that he was not a believer of Jesus when Jesus was walking the earth. In fact, he was the most skeptical. His brothers and sisters who lived with him in the house, grew up with him, thought he's just our brother. He's not the Son of God. They did not believe. But it took a personal experience with the resurrected Jesus. They didn't believe till he died for them. They didn't believe till they till he appeared before them and said, Look at my hands. Look at my feet. I'm alive. And because I'm alive, you can live too. You don't have to be afraid. You can live fearlessly today. And that's exactly what James took hold of. And it, it became his life. He became devoted to Jesus Christ. He became a devoted believer. And he didn't identify himself as saying, I'm the brother of Jesus. He identified to say, I am a servant, a bond servant of Jesus. I'm, I'm dying out to James. I'm dying out to who I was, the unbeliever. And I'm going to become James the judge. I'm going to become James the, the devoted, James the one who's going to die for what my brother died for. <laughs> my brother, not just my brother Jesus, but my Lord Jesus. Is he your Lord today? Do, do you confess him to the people around you? Do they know that you're set apart? Do they know that you're full holiness of the Lord, that you're walking with God? By your actions, by your fruit, do they know that? Do they know that you belong to the Savior today? Nobody could deny it with James. They knew who he, who he belonged to. And he did it humbly. And he said, I am a servant. I am a bond servant. I am in permanent relationship to serve for my Lord. Are you willing to serve for your Lord today? Are you willing to do whatever it takes? That's who he was, James the Just, half-brother of Jesus, which is recorded in Matthew 13, 55. He was also the brother of Jude, who also uh, wrote another book of the New Testament. He led the church in Jerusalem, according to Acts 15, and he received a special appearance of the resurrected Savior, and that changed everything for him. And it's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. You will see that it says that he appeared to Cephas, which was Peter. He appeared to the other apostles. He appeared to all the people in the upper room, and then he says he made a special appearance before James, his brother. He wanted James to know, I was really who I said I was. I am. I am that I am. I am the Messiah. I am the one that you've waited for. Even though I lived in the same house with you and you didn't believe me while I was here, I want you to see now and believe. And he did. And, and like I said, he became a great devoted uh, follower of Jesus, Jesus so much so that people said he prayed so much. He had callous sneeze from his prayer life and that he was martyred, um, thrown from the top of the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem. He didn't die from the fall, but he did die at the bottom when he was beaten to death by his attackers. But as he was attacked and as he was dying, just like Stephen did, he said, Lord, forgive these people that have attacked me. Now that's the love of God. If that's not devotion to Jesus, I don't know what is. And when you're willing to die for him, when you're willing to forgive those who, who cause you harm, who hurt you, then you really have something. You've got something that's beyond this world. You've got something that only Jesus could give you. And this is who James is. Um, so as we look at this letter, this letter written to the church, a letter to encourage us to, to have the fruit of faith, to have the evidence that we believe, and, it, and the teachings of Jesus are all over this book. And it's because James took it seriously, even though uh, people didn't think he was taking it seriously. He was listening. And when the Holy Spirit got a hold of him and revealed Jesus to him and he saw the resurrected Jesus, nothing was the same. And you won't be the same either. When you have a real experience with Jesus and you accept him in your heart and in your life, you will never be the same. And neither was James. So the first topic he's going to get to for us is this prayer of faith and having patience to endure in trials. I don't know about anybody out there, anybody going through trials out there. Well, if you're going through trials, just like me, this is going to be a word to encourage our soul today. He says, my brethren, count it all joy. Hmm. Joy. 
when you fall into diverse temptations. When you're going through trials, count it joy because this. We know this. That the trying of our faith, the trying, it means God's trying us. He's proving us. He's seen what we're made of. He's seen what kind of faith that we possess. He knows what kind of faith we possess. But we need the trials so we know what kind of faith we possess. We need the trials so that people around us will witness how we handle trials and how our faith worketh patience. But let patience have its perfect work. And he says, let nothing uh, be wanting because we're going to be made perfected and entirely pure and, and, and worth this race that we're facing. The, everything that we're going through is going to be worth it. We're not going to be lacking anything if we'll just endure to the end, as Paul said to us. Endure with patience, letting God perfect in us what he needs to perfect to make us more like him. That's what trials do in us. He says, if you ask liberally of God for wisdom, he will give it to you. And he's not going to upbraid you. That means he's not going to scold you for coming to him and asking him for help. God wants you to come and ask for his wisdom. Your knowledge and the things that you have knowledge of will only get you so far in this life. I have a master's degree in music, but that will only get me so far. It will only help me know so many things. But the wisdom of God puts everything together. It puts all the pieces of your puzzle together. Knowledge, your knowledge, your human knowledge will only get you so far. But godly wisdom will put you in places that you were never qualified to go. It will take you places that you were never qualified to go. So I thank God for that. I thank God for his wisdom. I thank God for his mercy and his grace. And, and that he is with us, helping us endure through whatever we may, we may go through. So let's look at the next verse. He says, let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering means don't doubt when you ask God. Believe him. Because if you waver, he says you're like the wave of the sea. You're being driven and tossed by the wind. There's a lot of people who are being driven and tossed by the winds of life. It might be the people that they live with that are tossing them to and fro. Because those people in, in their life, they may have not made a decision for Christ. And so that's pulling them off. It's distracting them. It's destroying them spiritually. So we got to be careful of the company that we keep. We cannot keep company with darkness. We've got to be careful about that. We want to be lined up with people who don't just believe in God, but have the evidence that they believe in God. They've got the evidence of how they're living, how they're talking, the company they're keeping, the places that they're going, the things that they're saying, the words that are coming out of their mouth will be the evidence. It's going to be the fruit of knowing if that person is really a believer or not. So this was, this was such a man that James was. Count it all joy. Because you got to realize that trials are going to come to everybody. It's going to happen. It's inevitable that you're going to have trials. It's inevitable that things are going to happen, that suffering is going to happen, that things are going to come to you that you don't expect. But it's used to produce fruit, and this, produ this fr fruit that's being produced is patience. And nobody likes to go through what it takes to produce patience. My dad always said, don't pray for patience. Uh, because you wish you hadn't. Because you'll have all kinds of trials to try to produce that fruit in you. And that's true because faith is tested through trials. And it's not produced by them, but it's tested by them. Trials reveal what faith you really have. And it's evident to those around you. And it's evident to yourself when you see how you react when trials come to you. Because it's easy to praise God, thank God, when you're on the mountain. But when you're suffering and going through the valley and you're going through the shadow of death, um, it's harder then to find something to praise about. It's harder then to, to count it all joy, as James is telling us to do here. But that's what faith is built on, isn't it? Faith is built on hearing and hearing by the word of God, that we hear, that we understand God's word, and that we trust in his word. And then by doing that, it produces the joy that we need, that we might be lacking. So God doesn't send trials to break our faith. Realize that today. He doesn't send them to break our faith. He allows them to strengthen us and to produce the fruit that we need to produce. So how are you receiving trials today? Are you receiving it in a resentful, bitter manner? Or are you receiving it with joy, as, as James is saying here? Because this is faith's response. If you have the faith of God in you, you're going to respond with joy when trials come. Because you're going to realize that this too shall pass. This will pass. And patience in a trial is the mark of a fully blooming, mature Christian. Think about that for a minute. Your patience, you being patient, you waiting on the Lord, you seeking after Him, you follow after Him, and as you do those things, you become more like Him in all that you say and all that you do. So, we become rich, as he says, in faith. 
and he's telling us here not to think that, that we're going to receive anything from the Lord if we're double minded meaning one day you have faith and the next day if things don't go your way you don't have faith you know you're double minded he says you're unstable in all your ways just as the wind just as the sea has no rest he says here neither does a doubter think about it when you're not resting in God you don't have rest you don't sleep good when you're not resting in God you know if you're unstable you're a doubter if you're driven by the winds, so are doubters. Doubters are pushed to and fro to this doctrine. What, what does this one say? This church isn't doing what I want. I'm going to move over here to this church that will. You know, we're driven to and fro when we're not grounded and stable in our faith in God. And, and the sea is capable of destruction, isn't it? It can crush you just like that. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to drive you and toss you and confuse you and make you unstable in all your ways that you won't trust in God, that you won't believe on Him because if you don't believe on Him, then He can put you where He wants you. He can put you in the prison that He wants you in. So he says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice when he is exalted, but the rich that he is made low because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. We don't put confidence in the things of this world. We don't put confidence in the people of this world. With riches fade. Your life and your identity can't be in what you own. It's got to be in who owns you. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. Your, your life and identity can't be in what you own in this world. It's got to be in who owns you. Does God own you? Does he know that, that he possesses you? Do you know you possess him? Do others see that? Because we can't place our confidence in things that fade away. We need to place our confidence in the things that never fade away, which are heavenly things aren't they things not of this world that is our encouragement today if you're going through a trial today that's your encouragement to realize that whatever trial you're going through it's temporary because eternity is forever it's forever there is no middle ground either we believe God or we don't believe God we've got to be on his side or we're not on his side there's no middle ground with God We've got to be seeking his wisdom, seeking his ways, asking of him that gives generously. He, he's our foundation. He's our everything. That faith is the, that foundation that we build of faith. Then we build upon that and we grow. And as we grow in him, we become stronger to face more trials that come our way. We begin to endure, as James tells us here. Um, and 11, the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat and the withered the grass. The flower that falleth, the, grass, uh, the grace of fashion as it perishes, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. All those things that you've placed your confidence in, one day they're going to be gone. I know a lot of people who boast about what they have and that they got this new thing or that new thing. But those new things will be old at some point. They're not going to they're not gonna last forever. Things of this world don't last forever. Material things will be gone. But what we've placed of our treasures in heaven will never fade away. And he's telling us in verse 12 that we're blessed. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Endure it. That means you got to go through to the end. you got to see it through with the Lord holding your hand, knowing that he's got you, knowing that he's not letting you go. That when you're tried, that you should receive a crown of life, he says, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. He's promised that to you. He says, let no man say he is tempted that I'm tempted of God, because God does not tempt us with evil, neither can he be tempted by any man. But every man is tempted when they are drawn away by their own lusts and enticed. You know, we see so many people right now that are just having a falling away, and they're falling away because they're being enticed and pulled away by people, things of this world. Satan is tempting them with the things of this world, people of this world. And they're going along with them because they might love. They think they love that person. So they're going to go along with them to make them happy. But realize at the end of the day, you cannot go along with people and make them happy when they're doing things that are against God's word. You have to take a stand. You have to say, I have to live for God. I have to do what I'm supposed to do for him. So we're going to be blessed when we do that. We're going to be blessed when we endure temptation that that testing reveals our genuine and strong faith. The work of God in us is going to be evident as we resist temptation, not when we give in to it, when we resist it. Our love for God is going to be our motivation, our honor, the glory that we give to God, and our relationship with Him. So that's what He's telling us in these verses. You know, God doesn't tempt us. 
We're tempted by Satan. He might allow, God might allow the temptation to grow us and make us stronger. But he's not going to do something to harm us or to tempt us or to make us do something to draw us away from him. That's never God's intention. So he says, we're, we're pulled away when we, we're pulled away by our own lusts, by our own wants, by our own needs. That we lust after things and then it brings forth sin. And then that sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Think about that. Something may seem pleasurable now. It may seem comfortable to you right now. It may seem like the right thing and feel good right now. But that thing that you're doing, is it going to bring birth fruit of sin in your life? Or is it going to bring forth the good fruit of God in your life? That's what you have to ask yourself at the end of the day. Being with this person, is it going to hurt me? Or is it going to... To bring glory to God by me being with that person. Are they encouraging me in the ways of God? Because at some point we have to make a decision. We have to make a decision. Are we going to be on the Lord's side? Or are we going to be on the side of someone who's leading us off into a path that we never intended to go which will lead to death? He says, do not err my beloved brethren. Do not err. But err on the side of God's side. Do what you know is right. And that, that in testing that we go through, temptation doesn't come from God. He may allow it, but he's never going to entice us to do evil. That's not in God's nature. So if you're being enticed to do something that's out of God's will, you know, like shacking up with somebody, living with somebody before you're married to them, um, or or living with somebody that is not a believer, you know, someone that is not doing the right things of God, that is just pulling you off a path, taking you farther and farther away from God. Be careful. Be careful of those things. Because we don't know when the Lord could come back. And I don't, I don't want you to be lost. And so I'm telling you the truth of the word of God here today that, you know, God may try us. We may go through different different things that may tempt us. And when we draw off into those temptations to do those things that this world says is okay. The world says you can live with anybody you want. The world tells you you can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. But that's not what God's word says. God says we're fearfully and wonderfully made in his likeness, in his image, and that we're to do the things that bring glory to God. So we've got to watch what we do and what we say. We've got to draw ourselves toward God, not away from Him, by our own desires. Because the devil is always enticing you to be pulled away. So deception is, is the devil's greatest um, tactic that he uses against us to say, everybody's doing it. Well, that's not true. Everybody isn't doing it. Um, or this is, this is the normal. You're, you're not normal if you don't do this. That's a lie of Satan. So remember God's goodness. Remember who God says you are. Remember your identity is in Him. That God's goodness is constant. It doesn't vary. I love what James says here. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it cometh down from the Father of lights. Not the Father of darkness. The Father of lights. I hate all the places that I've had to go to where it's dark. I don't want to go in a dark place. I've never liked the darkness. Even when I was little, I wanted the light on. I wanted a little night light. I don't like the dark. I want to be in the light because that's what Jesus is. Jesus is the light. And churches, turn the lights on. We need the light on. We need to see what's going on. If you're ashamed to come to the Lord and you only want to come to Him in the darkness, shame on you. We need to come to God and lay it all out on the table before Him and be, be very clear that we know who we belong to and that we're willing to come to that altar any time we need to to confess our sin before man and God. Because I'll tell you what, I'd rather confess it here on this earth and everybody see it than have it confessed in, in the, the courts of heaven in front of everybody that I didn't know Him, that I didn't come to Him when I could have because I was ashamed to come in the light. I want to come in the light. I want everybody to see in broad daylight that I love Jesus. I don't want to do it behind closed doors. I want to come out. Everybody else is coming out of the closet. Christians, you need to come out of the closet. Come into the light. Come into the light of Jesus Christ today. That's what he wants from us. He wants us to quit hiding in the dark. It says there is no shadow. There is no turning. God is constant. He's consistent. Whew. Praise God. We need something that's consistent in this world. He is the only thing that's consistent. He doesn't associate with shadows. He doesn't associate with dark things. He is the Father of lights. He is the author of our salvation. He is our glory. <laughs> when we live for Him, we're His glory. Hallelujah. God brings forth that good fruit in our lives. To be the evidence that God is in this world. The love. You shall know them by 
our love for one another. People will know God because of the love that you show them. The love of God. That's what love is. Love isn't love. God is love. He is our everything. And He brings forth the good fruit that we need. So we stand together with Him. His own, He says, will be God us. The word of the truth that we should be the kind of first fruits of His creatures. We're the first fruits of God. I hope you give your first fruits to the Lord. Whatever you make at your job, I hope that you give your 10% to the Lord. It's not that He needs it, but we give it to Him because we love Him. Because He is first in our life. We give it to Him for the, for the work of God to continue to carry on. And if you're not giving that, then you're robbing God. That's what God says in His Word in Malachi. You're no more than a robber. He says to prove Him this. He says the only thing God asks you to prove Him with is money. That you know that your money doesn't own you. But that God owns your money. That He's in control. And that we give it over to Him. Because we're the His first fruit. So I'm going to stop there today. Because this is a good place to stop. St because the next time I talk to you, we're going to talk about being doers of the Word. Having that action type faith. That, the faith that moves. That verb faith. That, that moves. It's an action. And we're going to talk about God's goodness some more too and how to take a stand against anger. So I hope that you have enjoyed this today. I hope it has encouraged you to keep going, to endure trials with joy, to know that joy is coming. Don't give up. Jesus said to endure it. Endure. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't quit. This isn't the time to quit. This is the time to keep going. We got to carry on. We got to live for the Lord. We got to shine our light and take as many with us as we possibly can to heaven. If this has helped you today, please like and share and subscribe to our channel. We would love to have you help us share the word of God with as many people as we can. And that's how we do it, through you sharing it. If you even just share it with three people today, that will get the word of God out to, to more people than you can imagine. So God bless you, and I'll see you soon.